we've been in a series for the last month or so called um, Your Kingdom Come. And uh, we are culminating this series. We're finishing this one off with an outpouring night this Tuesday night. And really, this sermon is just a long way of saying, come to Tuesday night. <laughs> this sermon is really just a big advertisement for Tuesday night. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm going to speak on uh, passionate worship. What, what is worship? Why do we worship? Why do we sing songs? What does it mean um, to be worshippers um, here in church? And so um, let's take a look at this. I don't know what your experience of, uh, what you think of when you hear the word worship. I don't know um, if, you're, if you're a bit like me. As a 16-year-old, I'd never been to church before. And when I heard this word worship and when I saw what it looks like, I was, I was like, wow, this is a very like churchy thing, you know, worship. The word worship, it just sounds very religious and churchy and um, maybe you're here tonight and you don't have a background of church and you sort of think the same or maybe it's been a while for you coming back to church and um, I don't know what your experience is of, of when you hear that word worship, you know, like maybe is there part of you that sort of cringes a little bit or is there a part of you that's a little bit, you're resistant to it? Um, I know there'll be pe- people here that, would, that love that, that know exactly what worship means and they're, they're keen on that. But if you, picture, um, if you picture a place like Queen Street Mall in the city and you picture how busy that, that place is, imagine if you asked just 10 people who are walking down Queen Street Mall, imagine if you asked them um, who or what do you worship? You know, just secular people walking through there. I I imagine that nine out of ten times you would receive a very puzzled look and almost a bit of a um, a look of maybe even of contempt, you know, like worship, what do you mean? Like I don't worship anything, I'm not religious, I don't do that, I don't take part in that. For the secular, um, worship is understood to be this exclusively religious term. It's this thing, you know, when you sing and you dance in church, right? Isn't that what worship is? Like, it's all to do with church. You sing and you dance and um, clap and, and, and do that, and that's worship. But we know, as a body of, of believers, um, the, the Bible tells us worship is much, much, much more than just songs and music. Romans 12.1 says this. Paul says to the, um, the recipients of, of this letter, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. He says, this is your true and proper worship, offering your bodies as a living sacrifice. Tim Keller, he describes worship in this way. He says, worship is ascribing ultimate value to something, in a way that energizes and engages your whole being. In other words, worship isn't just this religious song and dance in praise to God, but it's actually much deeper. It's much more whole-bodied than that. It is ascribing and expressing ultimate value in something, in our case, God. And so the truth is that it's not a matter Um, of whether we worship or not. The truth is that all people, religious or not, engage in some sort of worship. All people ascribe ultimate value to something in their life. So the question isn't whether or not we worship. The question is who or what do we worship? Sam Duncan, a um, lecturer of sports media, Um, says this way back in 2016. He said, Australia's obsession with sport has reached religious proportions. He gave some figures. These are back from 2016, but I I, I fact-checked. They've they've gone up. Um, He quotes that there are 13,000 churches in Australia compared with 70,000 sports clubs. 92% of adult Australians have an interest in at least one sport and 2.3 million people volunteer time for sport each year. And a stat from this year says that sport generates around $50 billion each year, which is 2 to 3% of Australia's GDP. Sam Duncan calls commercialised sport in Australia Australia's new religion. 
And uh, if you've been to a live uh, AFL or NRL match recently, you'll see how members of this religion engage in worship, right? You know the ones, you see them and, and you just can tell immediately. They are devoted, they, they will never miss a game. They are there every live game. They know all the players, they call out to the players as if the players know them, you know. They offer direction from the sidelines. They're set apart, they look different, they are in the team's colours. Some have face paint, some have tattoos. They're set apart for their team. They are, they are known physically um, for their team. And they show utter faith and loyalty to that team. They cry out with a passion. They are so in, engaged and so passionate in their worship of the team. And if anyone says anything bad about their team or if anyone goes against their team, they will make sure you know about it. They will stand up for their team. They are so devoted. One commentator says this, we as Christians would learn a lot about worshiping our God from watching how people worship sporting teams. The same can be said for um, celebrity culture in our society as well. You know, how, how we have a tendency to worship celebrities um, who can forget the hysteria that was created by the boy band One Direction back in 2011, 2012? I don't know the exact year, okay. Or maybe the Beatles in the 60s or, or something like that. And people, and you know I'm talking about a certain demographic of people, I know, people would scream and shout at the top of their lungs at, at these concerts. You know, they'd go crazy. They would faint at the sight of, of One Direction. They would, they would pass out because they, couldn't, they just couldn't fathom their presence. They would scramble to catch them as their limo dro drove past just to reach out and touch them. You know, this fanaticism of these celebrities. The other I thought of for our um, society is a worship of money. You know, we live in a society which uh, worships money because um, it's, it's been structured or it perceives money to equate to privilege, power, and pleasure, right? A, um, get this, this quote, a young economist back in 1844 said these words, in a society that worships wealth, those with wealth are worshiped as well. And we see this in our world, don't we? This worshiping of these people who are rich and they, they, um, they get away with, with stuff that poor people uh, don't get away with because simply by virtue of them being rich, there's a, there's a sense of awe about them. They're perceived to be of higher value. They are ascribed ultimate value in our society, are they not? And so worship of things in our world is, is everywhere. It's, it's in all cultures all across the world. This is not just a Western, these examples I give are, are, I guess, more Western than not, but in all cultures across the world, there is the worship of stuff, worship of things. And it's not a matter of if we worship, it's a matter of who or what do we worship. Now, I, um, I love sports, right? I love, um, I have my teams I follow who I love to support. Um, I show loyalty to them. I follow their games. I sometimes get a bit too um, involved in the stats and a bit too involved in the players. And, you know, the Broncos are going really well at the moment. So it's like, oh, you know, like it's really in enjoyable to, to watch them for once. And, um, <laughs> but at times, to be honest, I, I feel this, I find myself way too invested. And I'm sure there's people here tonight that can say the same. Whether it's sport or something else, you find yourself way too invested at times and you feel that, you, you recognize that. And I wanna say I'm not, I'm not guilt tripping here tonight. I feel this and I, I knew it when I felt this, I was like, oh, this is a message that it's gonna be one that you preach to yourself, you know? And... Um, I want to say hobbies, sport, and money are by no means bad in and of themselves. People of, people of influence are, are by no means bad in and of themselves, right? They are gifts from God. But when they become the ultimate object of our worship, 
when we ascribe to them ultimate value, even above that of God, then we are in need of revival. Are we more passionate at the footy than we are at church? Are we more loyal to our teams than we are to Jesus? Are we more talkative about our passions and and our hobbies and sports than we are of Jesus? And do we invest as much time and energy and brain space and thoughts into our identity in Christ as we do, say, our finances, say, our uh, financial positions, or say, the the latest happenings in the lives of of some um, influencer we follow or a social media um, celebrity. In the book of Acts, uh, we're told that Paul finds himself in Athens. And uh, Acts gives us a bit of um, detail about this. It's a city that's bubbling with secular philosophy and ideas. They love a new idea is what... um, Acts tells us they're really into the here and the now, what's happening, what's new, what can we, what can we um, take on right now, you know? And Paul is distressed to see that the city is full of idols. Acts 17, 22 picks up the story and Paul stands up in this big, large meeting of people and he says these words, he says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And the same applies to our culture today. Our culture says we're not into religion. We don't, we're not into that. No, that's weird. We're not into worship. We don't do that whilst at the same time worshipping things all around them. And we are ignorant, so ignorant of those objects of worship around us, we don't even, even recognise we're worshipping them. And if we do, we're not even sure why we're worshipping them. We're exactly like the people in Athens who, who inscribe on an altar to an unknown God. So Paul sees this, calls this out, and then says to them, he says, Um, I see these false idols that you've got. Let me tell you about the one who is actually worthy of your worship. Let me tell you about him because you need to know about this. This is what Paul says. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. In other words, Paul says, why? Why are you bothering creating these idols out of things that have just been made by human hands? They're just human inventions. Why are you worshipping these things when you could, be, you could come and worship the one who is worthy, the one who, is, who gives everyone and everything life? The one whom through the world was created and through and who is its rightful ruler, the God Almighty, Jesus Himself. He's saying, let all other things, you know, as good gifts as they may be, and we can recognize them as good gifts, let them though fade into utter insignificance in the face of our one true Lord. Ascribe ultimate value to the one who is deserving, who is himself our ultimate. This is what Revelation 4.11 says, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by your will they are created and have their being. This is what it means when when we sing. There's words that often say this, you are worthy, God, you are worthy, you are worthy. And it means to say you are worthy of of being assigned ultimate value. You are worthy of being lifted high above everything else in our lives, of being magnified greater than all things. You are worthy to receive glory and honour and power. There's other stuff around that is good gifts, but is not worthy to receive glory, ultimate glory, honour and power. There's only one, and that is God himself. 
Now, I don't think that most of us here would, um, would actively choose to worship something else over God. You know, if you're a Christian here tonight, uh, you would in good conscience, if you recognize that there was something in your life that is taking over from God, you, w- you would in good conscience act to, to stop that, right? No, I don't think anyone here is actively worshiping something else and, and sort of you know, choosing to do that. That's something that we try and avoid. But the worship of these things, of idols and man-made things, it happens uh, really sneakily. It happens um, in the back of our minds. And it slips in when we're unaware and it usually is a, is a progression. It's a lo- over a long period of time do these things start to sort of um, take over from our worship of God. And what I think happens is these, these things, they're good, they start out as good gifts and they start out as good things in and of themselves and they pose as these really innocent, non-threatening things in our lives. And it usually starts really acceptably and you know, almost godly and right and, and all things good. But when we are not careful, when we're not on guard, it can begin to erode our worship of Christ. This is what Colossians 3 tells us. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's a direction here. There's a how-to here. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly and then express that to God with gratitude in your hearts. Let the message of Christ live in you, abide in you, walk with you, dwell in you. And then let your worship be the expression of that inward message. If the message of Christ, and when I say the message of Christ, it is is the gospel of his redeeming work in us, his unfailing love and grace and mercy in our lives. If that doesn't take center stage in our hearts, in our lives, if it doesn't dwell amongst us, if it doesn't go with us where we go, then we leave ourselves open to worship of false idols. We leave ourselves open to worshiping other stuff. Enjoyment of something is one thing, but if that enjoyment of that sport, of that, of that music, of that, of that money, if that thing dwells amongst us more richly than the message of Christ, then we will worship that thing. Our true worship of God is the outworking of the message of Christ dwelling within us. It, it, our true worship doesn't start with singing songs on Sunday. It doesn't start in that. That is, that is not the, the beginning of true worship. It starts with a Christ-centeredness in our lives. It starts with letting that message of Christ dwell amongst us. It starts with with Christ being magnified more than anything else in our lives. Think about it like this. If worship is the expression of thankfulness to Christ, we cannot worship if we are not actually thankful for Christ. If worship is the expression of need and dependence on God, we can't truly worship if we don't actually think we need him, can we? Hence, worship must start with this Christ-centeredness in our lives, a a fixing on him, allowing him to dwell with us, being conscious of that, allowing him to dwell with us. And so with this like revised picture of worship, maybe maybe you know a bit of that, maybe you've thought about that, um, but with this revised picture of worship, then the, the question that follows is, well, what does worship actually look like? You know, what does that really actually look like in, in, in my life? And um, this is where we see a really exciting thing for our lives, and, and that is that worship 
can be almost anything. It, it, with a Christ-centeredness, all things that are good and within God's will are an opportunity to be an act of worship. This is incredibly exciting in the life of a Christian because we, we see how, how God can be glorified in almost every means of our life, in every sphere. You don't have to wait till Sunday to, to sing, to worship Him. You can worship Him in, in all parts of your life. If you remember um, Olympic high jumper Nicola Oleslagas came last year and, and, and um, spoke to us about her heart for um, seeing God move in the sporting world. And um, what stuck out to me as I, I watched a few of her um, messages and what's, what stuck out to me was this, this thread through what she said. Um, and it was reflective of the fact that she sees her training, her jumping over a stick as she would say it, she would see that as an act of worship. Why and how? Because her heart is fixed on Christ. Her heart, her, in, her, in full view of, in her mind and in her life is Christ. And so she sees her high jump as a platform to make the love of God known to the world. That sport, that, that thing has become the means for worship in God, but it is not a, a means for worship in and of itself. That's not where her heart lies. Her heart lies for Christ. And she uses the platform of high jump and sport to, to uh, worship him through. This is freeing for us. If you're... <laughs> If you're um, not particularly musical or anything like that, you might be like, oh, maybe I'm just not a good worshiper. You know, maybe I'm, this isn't for me singing songs. But I want to tell you that the worship of God can be done through a variety of mediums. It can be done in, in so many ways. It's, it's through song, yes, but it's through art. It's through dance. It's through creating something. It is through building. It's through running and jumping. It's through cleaning it's through serving. It is through just about anything that is within the will of God. It is an act of worship. But all things follow the same intent, is that he would be made bigger, more prized than all other things in our lives through that act. So then why do we come to worship God through song? Why do we, we're having this outpouring night and this is the culmination of our um, series, you know. This is, this is uh, where we as a church see the great importance in singing. And why do we do this? Every service we, we start and finish with song and in worship. And it's, um, it's interesting. There's a direction in the Bible specifically to come and declare that God is our ultimate um, through song. God is passionate about singing. There's 400 references in the Bible to, to singing and 50 direct commands to sing in the Bible. So if you, if you thought when I said before about um, you can worship in other ways, um, you still gotta sing. It's still, part of the, it's still part of the deal. It doesn't matter if you're not good at singing. It doesn't matter if you're incredible at singing. That's not the point. Singing in a community is, is vital to the heartbeat of, of the Christian life. We're told to sing together. It's not just individualistic. It's, it's not just a good performance. It's not anything like that. It is, it is a communal togetherness um, that is created as we sing together. And let me just say as well, songs and psalms and hymns are, are, are really a, a, a layer on top of a life lived in worship, Right? You've felt that on a Sunday when, you, when you, you're not feeling it, you know? You come on a Sunday and you might see people on stage and you're like, they just look like they are loving it on stage. Like they just look like they're having the best time and I just, I can't, you know, I can't will myself into, into worshipping, you know? I, I can't manipulate my heart and my emotions to just start sort of feeling it, you know? Praising God through song, let me just say, doesn't supersede his word, nor does it undermine his word. But it's powerful because it offers us a chance to declare his truths and vulnerably offer ourselves to God. Singing is a vulnerable thing, isn't it? If you've ever had to sing in front of someone, just you and, you and the other person in the room, you will feel vulnerable. It is a vulnerable experience. 
But when we sing, we are declaring, we are physically saying, and when we are saying these things, we are agreeing with it when we say them. And so we're physically declaring truths of God. We are speaking them into reality. We are making them, we are making them happen in our, in our um, times of worship. And so I wanna read you this psalm um, to just sort of talk a little bit about this whole singing in worship, why we do this, and sort of like a bit of a framework, I guess, if, if you're sort of unsure about this. Let's read Psalm 95, 1 to 7. It says this, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. There's directions here, which is we, we can be very thankful for. There's directions in this psalm. And the direction is when we, when we sing to God, when we engage in worship through song, is that we are engaging our whole being. We're engaging our mind. That is, we are hearing his voice and listening and accepting his voice. That's, that's referenced in verse 8. We are engaging our will. That is, we are submitting. It says, come and kneel, come and bow down, come and take part, come and, come and actively participate. That's in verse six. And then we are also engaging emotions. We're engaging our, our, the emotional sphere of, our, of ourselves. You can't sing and shout to the Lord with passion without engaging your emotions, right? And so the whole psalm is littered with this passionate, passionate language. And we can see if, with three of those um, things, actually um, a commentator, I'm not sure, I think it might be Keller, says um, with, our, with engaging our mind, will and emotions, he likens it to our heads, hands and heart. You're engaging your head, hands and heart. And so if we take one of those three things out of the equation when we come to worship, we can see how worship starts to, to fall apart. It loses its intention. If we worship with our minds, that is, if we um, engage with the truth of the lyrics and if we, um, we sing it with emotion as well, so we're engaging our mind and our emotions, but we don't engage our will, we simply become spectators, don't we? We, we just become spectators of worship. We just, we're on looking, we're just watching it happen before our eyes. We don't come to submit ourselves, we don't, we're not moved to action. It, is, it, it stays purely theoretical in our minds. We, the power of worship um, loses its power as we, as we don't submit ourselves to him. If we worship, um, in another example, with our emotion and our will, that is we are exuberant and we are passionate and we are moved by worship and we allow it to, to move us, but we don't engage our mind then worship just becomes this emotional experience. It becomes this experience that ebbs and flows with particular songs and genres and particular singers and, and who's on stage and, and, it, and it ebbs and flows with, with this emotional, aesthetic experience, which ultimately doesn't, doesn't change the way we live. We're just moved in that moment. An example of this, I was at a... Um, concert a, a month or two ago, just a, a secular concert, and a, and the crowd was you know just just people, not not necessarily a Christian thing at all. And um, this this artist was playing this particularly moving song, and it was it's just beautiful. You know, music is powerful. It's it's beautiful, and even secular music, of course, is has has incredible emotive um, um, power. And um, this guy is playing this song, and I look around, and there's people that are so moved. You can see it in their faces. There's like shutting eyes, and then I see their hands go up, and I was shocked. I was like, "Am I? Is this Sunday? Am I at church? Like, what? I just couldn't believe it." And as I reflected on it, I was like, 
wow, they have, they have had such an emotional experience that they have been moved to actually lift their hands. You know, in essence, they've been moved to, um, their will has been moved. You know, they're, they're, they're participating in this, this experience that's happening. But there's no, there was no power in the lyrics. There was no, there was sort of, there was truth of the human experience, I guess, in the lyrics, but there was no, there was no speak of God. There was no power in it. There was no godliness necessarily in those, in those lyrics. And it got me thinking that, that these people are engaging in a way that we really need to watch out for with our worship. And that is, that is simply being swept up in a moment and chasing a feeling when it comes to, to worship, chasing this aesthetic experience, you know? That's what happens that we need to be aware of with engaging emotion and will, but not our minds. And lastly, if we, if we worship with our mind and we, we know the truth of the, the, the songs we sing um, and we engage our will, that is, we're like, yep, no worries, I can respond to that and, you know, we, we see that. But if we're not moved emotionally, Worship becomes a, just a chore that we get through in church, doesn't it? Like it just becomes this thing that, oh yes, we sing three songs and um, sometimes the pastor will, or the worship leader rather will pray in between song two and three and then we, you know, they, they sort of just, it's a process. It's not, it's not anything powerful. It's just simply routine, right? And that is, that is also a dangerous place as well. Heads, hands and heart. That's the direction that the Psalms give us. And lastly, as we approach our, our outpouring night this Sunday, we, we must recognize the importance and godliness of worshiping together as a congregation, as a people united together worshiping. The psalm we just read uh, makes a whole lot of use of let us. Let us bow down. Let us sing. Let us come before him. The act of singing is not just this individualistic thing, but it's part of a a broader body. It's part of a broader community that we are told to come and take part in. One commentator, R. Hughes, says this, a a vertical focus, that is a focus on God, a focus on um, Jesus, creates horizontal unity. And as we come together and as we come and we're united, as we fix on the cross, we fix our eyes upon God in worship, we are drawn together. We are united together by our common need of him. Yeah, we worship with our lives. We worship with our jobs and we, we sing to God in the shower and we sing to God in the car. You know, we do all that together. But we cannot underestimate the coming together and worshiping as a family. It's vital to the health of, of our church life, but also our personal life. Our worship of God is not this individual, what can I get out of this experience? And ah, oh, the worship wasn't good that night. And ah, oh, I didn't really feel it, you know. It's not about that. It is about a giving of thanks to God through broad community as a family of believers. Uh, uh, let this worship be the, be the, um, let this worship night, rather, this outpouring night, be faithful to the call that God has given us to be a church who passionately seeks him and seeks after the things that he is doing and wants to give thanks for him, who wants to come back and ascribe ultimate value to him through song. Let us sing together um, with that as our core focus. We're gonna, um, it makes sense, right, to wrap up tonight with worship and that's not just out of routine. Like, I know we always do that, but it makes sense, particularly tonight, to, whack, to wrap up with worship. Um, because we also, I also want to just, um, as, the, as the team come up and get ready and everything, um, I want to also just acknowledge that we need God's help in this. We need the Spirit. We need Him to help us. We, we, we all come to times of in communal singing together, we come with baggage and we have, we have heavy laden hearts at times and we need his spirit to, to teach us this, to, to help us in, um, in worship, to help us to commit to obey him and express his praise. And so um, just as the team get ready, I'm gonna pray and we're gonna sing um, a couple of songs, I think. And... Um, 
I'd love to just pray for the Spirit's help to help us tonight. And, uh, and then we're gonna spend time worshiping. And I wanna say as well, in this in time of worship, I, I wanna say that um, spend time thinking about, uh, thinking about the words that are being sung, sung and, and dwell on those words. If, if, engage your whole being as you, as you worship and, and submit to him, whether that's by raising hands, whether that's by bowing and, and kneeling, whatever that is. Be, be, be encouraged to, to engage your whole self as you come to worship him. And as, a, as just a time of, of worship together, um, I think like we'll, we'll stand together as a, as a sign of unity, but if there's moments where you, you want to sit and pray and, and, and focus in on, on a prayer to God or something, then you take that opportunity as well. Let me pray tonight as we come before God in worship. Lord, we thank you for the gift of yourself, Lord. Thank you that you, that there is an ultimate, there is, there is, that you offer yourself to us, Lord, and you say, come and worship me because you are our everything. You are our ultimate value, you are our prize, Lord. Father, bring to mind things that have gotten in the way, things that are um, subtle but are there, that are distracting and that are eroding, our, our, that are eroding the, the, the message of, of you dwelling in us. Lord, bring those things to mind, Lord. Help us, Lord, by your Spirit to... to to not see those things as these, these awful things that need, to be, that need to be done away with, but, but more so to see you as being so much more worthy of, of praising and honouring and glorifying, Lord. By your Spirit, Lord, lead us in that as we seek you. Help us, Lord, to act, to take part in worship, not to spectate, not to look on, but to be a part of what you're doing and lead us as well Lord in, in, in places that can be that we've never thought could actually um, be acts of worship Lord bring to mind things that um, you know break down that, that conception that it's only on Sundays that we worship you Lord help us to see our whole lives our whole bodies as worship to you great God as we come now to sing Lord we don't do so to, to be these amazing singers or to have this karaoke session, Lord, we long to authentically love you and, and meet with you. And so God, unite us together as we pursue you. Bring us into your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.